G'day, we're here today with David McBride, the Afghan war crimes whistleblower, whose trial comes up next month, November 13, and he faces 50 years in prison for blowing the whistle on Australian ADF crimes in Afghanistan. One of the most remarkable things about this saga with David McBride and other whistleblowers is the double standard. We've just done a piece on Oracle Corporation, the US multinational giant. It made 1.7 billion in government contract money over the past 10 or 15 years. And we've had a run through their accounts and we've identified 68 separate breaches of the law of the Corporations Act. David is facing 50 years in prison because they say that he has broken the law. So here we have a perennial lawbreaker in a US multinational corporation. And yet David faces 50 years in prison for breaking the law. David, can you tell us what you think about this double standard when they claim the rule of law is why they're pursuing you? Yeah, look, it's bullshit. And it's, it's the central problem of Australia at the moment. There is no law as far as the government is concerned. Uh, they, they use the law as an excuse to punish their enemies. They don't like me because I've embarrassed them. So they say national security. They do like Oracle, I presume because of huge donations and then of course they're lazy. And so the law is not enforced against Oracle. Now, once the law is not consistently enforced, it's not actually the law anymore. And, they, and that's how I actually started this case. I started this case not because I saw war crimes, but we saw, I saw that they were trying to prosecute good soldiers who just did their job. And I said, and they weren't prosecuting others who were under a cloud. And so I was like, hang on, we can't do that. This is a, maybe only a small example, but the law matters. And if you don't apply it consistently, everything falls down. And the government, whether they're just, uh, I don't know, like they're stupid, or they don't see it that way. They just see the law is a weapon they use against their enemies. And they don't realise that the whole uh, nature of our uh, country constitution will fall down. So how does the trial of the defamation trial of Ben Robert Smith affect your situation? Yeah, it's, it's one of the many nails in the government's coffin. There's been quite a few, um, but I, I believe that is, while I'm not a whistleblower against Ben Robert Smith in particular, I, I believe my, my you know, sort of case theory is that the government knew, knew about Ben Robert Smith. They knew of the allegations in late 2012 because Andrew Hastie complained about it. Uh, amongst others, and some of the corporals um, for his own uh, sort of cohort. Now, um, then they passed this new rules of engagement, which didn't really make any sense, and they were threatening murder charges. And, whatever. and I, I smelled a rat then. Um, now, and then they started trying to prosecute anybody, even people they had no jurisdiction over, like Americans. So I believe... Um, the Robert Smith case, now that we know um, with an, enough kind of uh, accuracy, because the witnesses who gave evidence against him were fellow SAS people. Sometimes it's cast as the media versus a hero. But actually, the, the witnesses, worth remembering, were SAS soldiers, every bit as brave, every bit as strong. Um, and they were the ones that actually put the nail in his coffin. Um, and so it's clear something was up in 2012. And uh, the government now trying to put me, and all I was really saying was something was up. We didn't prosecute anybody in 2012 and suddenly in 2013 we prosecute everybody. Uh, that's a fact now pretty much because of Robert Smith. Now the government will try to say, oh, we didn't know though. It's just a coincidence that we flipped at the end of 2012, nothing to do with, uh, we didn't know anything about Ben Robert Smith. Um, now, the public will find that quite hard. And also, he, he's not been charged. No one has been charged in relation to that. I'm the first person that's facing trial. I'm very likely to be the first person going to prison. And having traveled around Australia, I've met a lot of people and, and whether they're left or right or old or young, they all think that's pretty ridiculous. The fact that I, with everything went wrong 
in Iraq and Afghanistan and all the, uh, the wasted money, the graft, the murders. I'm the guy going to jail and all I did was give documents uh, which showed the truth. Now, most Australians think that that's ridiculous. So the Ben Rubber Smith trial was a civil trial. It was a defamation trial. Um, so, but the fact is that a lot of evidence came out of that trial about what happened in Afghanistan. Can they use that evidence? Because surely if they're taking you to trial for doing the right thing, for blowing the whistle, they're going to have to look at that evidence and do something about that evidence. Do you expect that they will? How can they take you to trial when all this evidence has come out about Ben Robert Smith? Well, you and I have been around long enough. Like every day you expose major scandals, every, pretty much every single day. I don't even have time to read them all, but nothing necessarily happens. I mean, Australia is broken. Um, we've seen that in the Michael Pizzullo's latest revelations. The guy that was running and pushing all this national security turned out to be a national security liability himself. Um, it is a topsy-turvy world in Australia. Yeah, no, I don't know that anything will necessarily happen with the Robert Smith stuff. Some of the tangential things that came out of it were very interesting. And as, as I suspected, my, one of my, another one of my case theories is that the whole war was run like a PR exercise like an Enron, um, and they, uh, they knew Robert Smith was good copy back in 2006. Now, he shot a shepherd boy, um, apparently unarmed, said he was a spotter, and not only and gave away their position of the SAS patrol and almost got them all killed. Now, instead of getting his ass kicked, he got a medal, a bravery medal for it, um, and... Uh, that set the scene and, and he was allowed to give interviews, I think it was the first one, and they, they saw he was this handsome, good-looking guy who, who could help them sell the war and they increased troop performances. And so one of the things that tangentially came out in the, in the defamation trial, that he wasn't on the top of the shortlist to get the VC, but he was bumped up um, over people uh, that perhaps were more deserving. Uh, because he was so good looking and because, he, because the PR people loved him and they knew he was going to be good copy. Now, if you, if you were a professional soldier and you, you, got, <laughs> you missed out on the VC because you weren't good looking enough, you'd be so angry. I mean, that's just, that is exactly the sort of sickness that made me want to become a whistleblower to say we have lost our way that we care more about. Uh, we are letting these 23-year-old, you know, you know, Bruce Lemon types decide who's going to get medals and who not um, because of uh, the way they look and the press conferences they give rather than the facts. And also in 2013, we're going to chuck guys in jail because press are talking, people are talking about it. We need to find some scapegoats. Let's not go after the people who have carried out highly suspicious operations. Let's find someone no one's ever heard of and put him in jail. I mean, that made my skin crawl. From a professional side of the body, you just think you would never do that. And it's because we've become so politicised. I heard it, that term, I was very happy to see it applied in relation to uh, Pizzullo this week. Um, that we are, and Robo Dead has helped my case a lot too, to say these uh, government departments no longer work for the people. They don't work for you, they don't work for me, they don't work for the good of Australia. They work to keep the government. It doesn't sound sexy, but you get it. But they are working towards the next election cycle, putting out false messaging, putting out phony messaging. And people like Bazzullo are perfect for that. Yeah, he would leak things um, which would make the hysteria go up and maybe would help the Liberals. Um, and uh, like, um, you know, famous leakings of, about Manus Island or whatever. And... Uh, and John Howard started right back with Tampa to say this, is, this was a money spinner for politicians to, to ramp up the security threat, you know, and they could get re-elected. But the departments are now doing these little political pantomimes in order to make the minister more popular. And the whole war, you know, we were pretending we were winning when we weren't. That was because the minister wanted good news stories. We gave medals to people who possibly didn't deserve them because the minister wanted a good news story. Sometimes we put people in jail because the minister wanted some sort of, I want to look tough story. Now that is really wrong. And again, uh, it's an embarrassment that I'm on trial because I'm a, I'm a dissenter. You know, I haven't, I'm not a tax evader. Um, I haven't committed any violence offences. All I have done um, 
is, uh, you know, expose the truth on this. And I'm also a persistent government critic, and they hate that. Uh, there's no damage to national security. Someone asked me about it yesterday to say, really, you know, murders on a hilltop in Afghanistan 10 years ago, we can't, the Chinese need to find out about that, do they? And as if they haven't read Chris Masters' book and Nick McKenzie's book and Ian McFedron's book and, you know, Trooper Donaldson's or Corporal Donaldson's book. I mean, it, it's ridiculous to say that there is information in here which is anything but embarrassing for our government, but they will maintain that till they die. So they've dug themselves a hole, basically. They've gone this far. Now they've got to go through with it, it seems. Uh, but in your favour, of course, is that, well, presumably in your favour is that it's not a judge trial, it's a jury trial. So you take the Rasputin-like activities of Mike Bazzullo, you take <laughs> the robo-debt double standards of, you know, going after poor people. You, all these things, and on, on top of that, you've got the Ben Robert Smith thing. So it's it's and and you're in the centre of it, having done the right thing. Now, how many jurors are there? Twelve jurors. Uh, yeah, twelve how, jurors. How, how how does that affect the trial? Having a jury trial, and is will it be a secret trial? Well, the government say no because the, the again because they've done polling. It's probably all done by Crosby Text or the equivalent. And people don't like secret trials. But, of course, it, it, they, so they say it's not secret trial. Whenever we say it, they write us a letter saying, how dare you suggest that? But it's only, it's only closed, get this, where national security matters. <laughs> and their definition of national security matters is where the toilets were <laughs> in Kapuka. You know, let alone Afghanistan. So it's just a joke. They are, they, if you had... Uh, comedians like Friendly Joy, you know, in the gallery, they would be laughing because it is, it is, it's become more utopia than utopia. But, yeah, 12, or having gone and gone about, this is, shows you how ridiculous it is, them saying, oh, I've damaged Australia's national security. They're getting 12 people or, or probably 20 because they're going to need a few burnouts, 20 people from the streets of Canberra, <laughs> and they're going to give them all this information to read. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with them after, kill them or something. <laughs> So don't get on the jury. But, uh, yeah, because what are they going to do? This is apparently super, super, super secret. But the jury, they get, and apparently they're going to give them some sort of iPad, high <laughs> security iPads. And uh, they're going to have to, like, they're not allowed to take them home or something, but they can read it. So it just, it's a bit of a joke when you think about it. And their security, they used to take, we used to we only be able to read the documents when they got moved around by an armoured car with a safe. And uh, one day the government sent the safe to the wrong, went to the wrong, the wrong city. They sent it to Melbourne like photocopy and <laughs> photocopy company. I had to get it back. So yeah, it's 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 Keystone Cops kind of stuff. And um, how it's going to work, uh, I don't know. But, um, well, they won't call it secret. They'll call it in camera. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And they'll probably make the secret bits or the in-camera bits, it's the not, embarrassing bits. I'll say it's not in secret, but only people, certain people with, with clearances can watch, you know, certified by Mike Bazzullo, that, uh, you know, pillar of, the, pillar of the community. So how long do you expect it to go for? It's, meant it's down for three weeks. I think it will go, well, the lawyers don't think it will, but I, I know they don't know about secrecy like I do. And Max was smart, and I know that slows everything down. It was like when you had to go to the, uh, you know, the special forces headquarters, whatever. You had these kind of Max was smart, Iris things at, at hand, and often they don't work very well. <laughs> Everybody has to queue up. It creates a bottleneck, and once you get um, sick, no doubt jurors are going to get sick or whatever. So I reckon we'll, we'll go the full three weeks, but we'll we'll see. You know, it's it, hopefully there'll be plenty of people down there. It is. I, I'm, it will be confronting in the courtroom because I, you, you've got all the people from, uh, there's like six lawyers for the prosecutors, there's about six lawyers for the attorney generals separately represented, which are kind of the spooks or the Americans. And um, while I can laugh now, it, it will be, it's pretty harrowing in inside the court and being cross-examined. And um, uh, yeah, I'm facing 50 years in prison. I've got two kids, and so it's it, it's not something which I, you know it won't be a joke when I'm in, when the trial starts. Well, the worst bit will be afterwards while you're awaiting judgment, and they won't do the too long because it's going to be a high profile case. And so then the oh, probably yeah. will be if I'm convicted, uh, yeah, I'll, um, yeah, that'll be that. But, but the hard thing is going to be sentencing, and I, you know, in that. Um, 
because I really don't want to see my enemies, just, they see me cry, you know. And if I get 20 years or something, it's going to be hard. Not not even about myself, but just because you think about the kids. And, um, and but I... Uh, I, there'll be after if I after conviction. But there'll, there'll be the appeals, surely, won't there? Well, there'll be appeals, but I mean that takes a while. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah I think we'll have a good. I've got you know a few people who are um, good people for uh, appeals lined up and who talk about community um, expectations. This is a great lawyer called Eddie Lloyd, and she's she's done some great work getting the environmental protests out of jail by saying. You know, most people in Australia think that, uh, you know, the environment matters and therefore you've got a sentence on community expectations and if most people in Australia think that protesting uh, for the sake of the environment, if you believe, it, is not a bad thing, you shouldn't be putting them in jail. And uh, she's, she's won on that case. So I think that, that that's a really good argument to say because I think most, it, it is, it's not an exaggeration to say most Australians support me. Um, but the government um, uh, won't listen to that and they won't care. But to raise that, to say, how, why are we putting someone in jail when most people think you did the right thing? Well, in terms of the NATSEC people, these are, they all operate in the shadows, so they're not yeah. in the public eye, so yeah. there's no embarrassment for them. But, of course, good old Mark Dreyfus, he's the one that's going to be copying all the flack because he can pull the plug on this any time he wants, can't he? He can. He says, well, "Oh, it's not except you know, not exceptional circumstances." And he and he, our spies tell us he says his hands are tied. But I mean, that's not really good enough, you know. You, you see, he was standing at the chopping block when you get your head chopped off, and if you say, "Sorry, there's more. I wish I could do more for you." I mean, he is the Attorney General, and um, what does it mean if you can't, if you don't have any control over the legal uh, system of the country? A few other cases do. Are they leaked? This is how disgusting the Defence Force or the Department is. They leaked when there was a scandal. They they leaked the address, home addresses of some people involved in the scandal to the media, so the media could go and paparazzi them. One and the guy ended up trying to kid, commit kill himself, and it was only about an obscene email trial. The guy's tried to kill himself three times. Uh, now, the Defence Department leaked, they, they did that. They leaked the guy's address. Now, that's disgusting. And they, um, uh, that is the sort of department you're joining if you join the ADF. Now, I'm hoping the young people come through and they clean it up. Uh, one of my big uh, aims is to be invited back as a consultant so we can start cleaning it up. And, and so that they can start saying, no, Minister, we are not going to throw our people to the wall. Well, surely you'd need action on the chain of command, I mean, before yeah. that could happen, because you've got, I mean, here's David Hurley, who was running the army yeah. at the time, now the Governor-General, having garden parties and so on, totally unscathed. Now, now, I correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I always thought that in the Army and in the Defence Forces worldwide, there was this principle of the commanding officer, that is the generals, being responsible for what went on below them. Why have they not been That's held accountable? Absolutely the number one cornerstone principle. Serve to lead, it was it, though. So you do whatever you're told. If you're told to do it, you do it. You so, do it. So, and and these guys have to take the fall. And yeah, Hurley has been nowhere, and he should be, he should be at least going to say the, the, the Burrington Report incidents, you know, 39 murders happened on my watch. I take ultimate responsibility because I was Did ultimate. Did he do that? No, of course not. He was like, oh, my God, I'm so shocked and horrified. How could they do this? didn't know any of this was happening. <laughs> How could they do this to me? I mean, what a creep. What an absolute creep. And um, uh, he's the governor and he's living in a palace with five servants. And Stephen Smith's off in uh, High Commissioner of the Londons. He's Stephen Smith, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got sent to London, so I can't subpoena him. Um, I th suspect he knew, and that's why I saw the journalists in the first place. Um, it wasn't just a matter of giving them documents. I was looking for the Bernstein and Woodward of Australia who would start not just take the documents from me but start making inquiries about who knew what and what was really going on. That doesn't really happen today. I was living in the, all the president's men fantasy world, but it would be nice to have... Um, uh, people who would actually do that and, and start making, take the documents by all means, but start doing more inquiries. I reckon Smith's office knew or very possibly knew and I reckon they were driving it. Um, ben Robert Smith didn't give himself the VC, you know, and uh, other people were involved and 
they, um, it was just way too, it's too much of a coincidence to think they didn't investigate any single, not a single murder in 2012 when they were 39. And yet in 2013, they suddenly go into hysterical panic stations about even when an American pilot shoots someone by mistake, they try and put that, you know, they try and treat that as a murder. Now that's weird, that's a big flip. And then there was a change of rules of anger. I, I reckon the minister's officers knew and they said, they went into damage control. Well, if they didn't, though, they're incompetent. Well, exactly. They're, 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 they're either complicit or incompetent. Take a choice. But the fact is, that unless they have a public process where these people have to take a stand and say what they did know and what they yeah, didn't know, exactly. and that never happened. The Brereton Report, exactly. of course, was a political exercise in a sense, wasn't it? To head off to say that we've had our inquiry. Like they, uh, so they did in the UK, exactly. And, and, and it stopped, as my uh, sort of cynical... The comrades in arms say it stopped the International Criminal Court coming in because they said, oh, we're, we're on this. <laughs> we're on this. But, of course, nothing's happened we're since. We've got it out of control. Well, it's, like, it's not the PWC inquiry, behind Ziggy. Like Ziggy. It. Yeah, Ziggy. It hasn't named uh, a single yeah. human being. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've no, got this under control. We're independent. taking this very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, nothing's happened from it. And, uh, it, it. and, of course, one of the key findings, which, again, people all around Australia... Young, old, left, right, fine, it sticks in their throat to say no one above uh, the rank of, uh, you know, captain can possibly be blamed for this, particularly uh, someone called David Hurley or, or anyone generally. People just say that cannot be true. So we'll pick on this bloke down the chain as a, who's, who's yeah, had yeah. the cheek. Well, pick, hey, yeah, there's <laughs> someone who's done, you know... Um, tell the truth. Done. It, was there a specific incident, though, that you could look back to and say, David, was it... Was it all worth it? Yeah, I think so. I don't wake up thinking that, but I go to bed thinking that. And, I, and I, it sounds a little bit grandiose, but I, I often think, well, be grateful for your enemies because they have given you uh, an opportunity to show your own character, which you may otherwise not have had. Which outcomes? that you set out to achieve, have you achieved? I know we're heading straight to the trial now, so it's a bit of a, it's a high pressure situation facing prison, but do, do, what outcomes have you achieved that you set out to achieve? There's a little bit more. I think it's, it, 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 this is quite of a, a joke. It's a little bit like a good Hollywood movie. It's all gonna to come together in act three. <laughs> At the moment, we're still... The darkest we're still, before dawn. Yeah, it's like yeah. three quarters of the way At the moment, Hollywood. we're still just at the end. of our, uh, We haven't had that glimmer of hope yeah. yet. I'm about to drop the bomb down the uh, the rubbish chute into the Death Star. Yeah. But at the moment, it's not looking that... It must admit, I haven't achieved that much. I've survived. Uh, but... Um, well, you certainly put spotlight. You put a spotlight on it. At least people know that everything wasn't what they well, said. You've achieved massive uh, sort of the public interest then. Sure. I've achieved massive public interest, yeah. I've, 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 I've realised, I've, you know, uh, mobilised a lot of really good Australians um, who are sort of proud of w what we stand when I just represent the whole cause, of course, but standing up um, against government excesses, government... Um, Department's gone mad, and and I hope to achieve. I hope to achieve that Australia is actually protected by the defence force rather than just the government. And that was. And I love seeing the word politicisation in the Herald on the weekend. I was saying that ten years ago, and of course people just thought it was sort of wank. Well, we didn't really get it, but it does matter. It matters in the sense that if the Department of Defence is only def defending the Liberal Party or the Labor Party, they're not defending Australia. And that is a problem. So the whistleblower laws, now you're a lawyer, Sid, and you're obviously sub, you've, you've, you've looked at them closely. What exactly do they need to do to make them watertight so that people like yourself, Richard Boyle, you know... Um, they need to throw them all out. They're hopeless. They need to start. It's again. absolutely You hopeless. can't just chuck in an amendment. Not surprisingly, you know, it would be like, you know, getting a... Uh, criminals to write, you know, criminal protection law. It, 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 it written from the completely the wrong idea. The government, it, they're trying to make people jump through hoop after hoop after hoop, and it's a reverse owner. So the government, the, you could be reporting on the Holocaust, but fail on 
as whistleblower laws because you didn't see the whistleblower delegate. You didn't report it within three months. The government gets to put up all these as if they're the criminals, like like arguing with DNA evidence or something, the way it was collected, the way criminals argue with police over various different procedural things. That's what the government does. And they just get to block block you. You don't get your, your legal fees paid. Um, we don't really, we don't need, whistleblowers don't need protection. We need accountability. We need um, action to be taken. The, the tragedy will be, it's not good enough for me to not go to jail. I want, I want General Hurley to answer some questions. I want um, the people at the top uh, to at least explain who knew what when, and, and, and I'll, that is really what we need. And that's what any whistleblower wants. They don't want to just be able to survive. Oh, we're going to protect you. You might even get your job back. Most of us don't want our jobs back. But we do want the people we pointed out for breaking the law, we want them to be held accountable. Indeed. Uh, and Mike Pizzullo, the, the, the revelations, well, if we didn't have these leaked texts and emails, then uh, the, the, the story wouldn't be running. So somebody's done the work there to get that in the public domain. But what, what they've shown is politicisation of the public service. So these people aren't independent. They're acting at the behest of ministers. Not only that, it shows a lot of things. And it shows that he, he, he was a sort of angry um, guy that played the, played the man, not the ball kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, everything was personal to him. He hated this guy, he liked that guy. Like, you know, and it was all like some sort of personal chess game and you can't have people running the country like that. Oh, I don't like this guy, I'm going to put him in jail. He insulted me once with the bar. You know, she, I made advances on that woman, she knocked me back. I'm going to make sure that, you know, I'm going to send the cops around to her house to search her. I mean, you can't have people who are so volatile and judgmental actually pulling the levers of, of, uh, of the police and the government. That is wrong. So now he needs to be paid out to leave, basically. <laughs> He'd be on 900 grand forever. <laughs> he can go and live with Hurley in the palace. <laughs> um, we've done ADF recruitment. We'll quickly do it in one part. This whole thing hasn't reflected well on the Defence Force, on the Army. Um, uh, how has recruitment been affected? Well, it's way down. They can't get people. Um, and, and that they, they reap what they sow. They throw people to the wolves. They don't look after their own people. Um, I mean, one thing, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I haven't made up my mind about Angus Campbell yet, but there's, within the Defence Force, he has a reputation for throwing people under the bus. Um, and uh, why would you join an organisation? Why would you join the Special Forces? go behind enemy lines and do, all the, do the incredibly dangerous things and then be sacrificed by your own government political experience. Well, the way it works in human terms, there are military families, aren't they, where the, the sons and daughters follow in the... And so, look at my So, so, so yeah. the 19-year-old, keen to become a soldier and a hero, they wouldn't be sort of paying much attention, but it's the families themselves. Is that the way yeah, that yeah. it works? Yeah, that's right. Most parents will be saying, and they've got a, their guy, um, Hugh Pote, whose son was killed in Afghanistan. I mean, he's incredibly uh, rightly righteous indignation against the Defence Force, um, the way they treated him and um, the way they lied about uh, what happened to his son and who was responsible. Again, they tried to blame everybody at the bottom and, and no one uh, above uh, Lieutenant got any blame. And that was clearly wrong, and they tried to shut him up. Now, people, so it's not, we've got Julianne Finney, whose son suicided. People, as you said, families of people who know are angry with Defence Force. And, um, and that's affected recruitment. Yeah, I, I think it's a great job for a young person, and I would never sort of say, don't join, but we need to clean it up. I'm here to try to do that. I mean, look at me. You can't get any better example of me. I was a military lawyer with an Oxford degree in Sandhurst. You know, I'd been a patrol commander, a platoon commander in Northern Ireland. Um, they're trying to put me in jail forever for daring to say we don't follow the law and something needs to be done. And, you know, that, that really epitomises the modern Australian Defence Force. So what's lacking in the government's proposed whistleblower legislative um, 
uh, reform. I mean, specifically the clause around grievances, the proposal states that a whistleblower case should be dismissed because it's motivated by, by grievance. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, uh, the whole thing needs to be thrown out. I mean, you, you, I would like to do a, a, an ad campaign with Troy Stoltz uh, and uh, you know, Jeff Morris. And they say, I, I'm not quite as cynical as them, but they say don't become a whistleblower. They say the government will crush you. All this sort of stuff does is um, just, you, if you have to report it up the chain of command and they say no, which they, of course, they will. Keep it in your pocket, don't go public. Yeah, and then, of course, you do go public, as, as the Act says you can. Mm. Who, do, who do they think, they, who are they going to come for? They've got your name, address and number because you last week you were complaining to them. Now the same documents, are, so it, you just you just out yourself. You probably achieve nothing except give them a, give them time. You have to do it under the law, but it, it's such a can of worms because the people who have got most to lose from whistleblowing are writing the laws. We need an independent uh, organisation, a whistleblower protection authority, uh, to be involved because you can't trust the government to help whistleblowers. Why would they cut their own throat? So. You want to see accountability from the government and the government governing properly in the interests of the people. But what do you want to see from the average person watching this video who's not the Attorney General or Mike Pizzullo? Well, I'm, I, I would give something back. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful to your viewers. You guys have been supporting me for a long time. So I, I, I hate to ask, continually ask favours, but I've got one more favour and that's what I would like is people to buy my book. The Nature of Honour, and the question you had, uh, it's coming out, you can pre-order it already. Uh, this is a mock-up, obviously, but um, uh, you asked the question before, like, what incident particularly pushed me over the edge? Mm. And I detail with that in the book. Obviously, it's quite relatively complex, um, but it is about uh, a particular SAS patrol uh, in 2013, um, way after the Brereton, you know, incidents um, where I believe they were kind of scapegoat someone who just did their job and they said, to, I, the government were going to, Stephen Smith's department, we're going to hang this guy out to dry. And I got the message in Afghanistan. I said, the, we all, the CO said, everybody knew this bloke was just defending himself in a life and death situation. Uh, he was a good soldier, he'd done six tours. And the government basically said, too bad, he's going to be collateral damage because we need a scapegoat. And at that point, I was like, this is bullshit. We have become a pantomime force where everything is PR. We let people, we give people medals who don't deserve them and we throw people to the walls who are just doing their job and I am not going to stand for it. And I said to the SAS bloke, I think I said to him, you're going to be investigated. Uh, it's political bullshit. And he looked at me and he said, well, isn't it your job to stop the political bullshit? And at first I was like defensive as anyone would be like, well, fuck, I've been trying. But then I realised after about two seconds that he was absolutely right. It was my job. I was a lawyer, I was a major, I was experienced, I was well-connected. Uh, if not me, who would? If not now, when? So you're being prosecuted, face life in prison for doing your job. Challenge is opportunity, that's right. But um, maybe uh, because of this case, we can fix Australia. The sort of stuff you talk about every day, it's not, it's not just the Defence Force, it's not just uh, uh, Oracle, it's everywhere. And uh, people, um, I'm so grateful to people like you and your viewers because together we can fix the, the rot which, which is killing our country. So the trial of David McBride comes up next month, November 13, in Canberra. It's incredibly important for Australia. We never advertise people's products and services, but I would in this instance, for this bloke who's facing 50 years in prison for doing the right thing, I'd, I'd, I'd exhort you to go out and buy his book and be supportive, give him some money if you can. Well, there's a link in the description if you want to help him financially and he needs it. Overall, the significance of this particular whistleblower trial, perhaps the most high profile one in Australia, is that institutions are getting bigger and there's no freedom of speech within institutions because they've all got social media policies and we can see how whistleblowers are being prosecuted. So that means you're going to have in these increasingly large institutions in Australia, you've got a haves and a have-nots and you're going to have 
constraint on people doing the right thing, so therefore long-term cultural problems. And we've seen it even with PwC is the, the glaring example. But this will pervade every institution if it's not open to Australians to do the right thing. Go to their bosses. Go to the media if their bosses aren't listening and go through, hopefully, what may one day become some effective whistleblower laws. Because otherwise, if you're rewarded for doing the wrong thing and shutting up and penalised for doing the right thing, then Australia is in a, in a huge world of trouble.